Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Gear of the Week show here on the Golf Monthly YouTube channel. This week we're going to be talking about some new products from Callaway and a new golf trolley I'm excited to talk to you about as well as one of the smallest laser range finders I've ever seen or Joel's ever tested. Uh, so look out for that. We've got an exclusive interview with New Zealand golfer Ryan Fox as well. A uh, pretty wide ranging interview talking about arm lock putting and some gear mistakes that amateur golfers make. Uh, so keep up for that. And then we'll be having a debate about uh, combo iron sets um, uh, with Joel today off, off a piece he, he published on the Golf Monthly website last week. So stick for that toward the end. Uh, no Neil Tapping this week. He is gallivanting somewhere on holiday, I'm sure, enjoying himself. So it's just me and Joel this week. Joel, how are you? How's things? I'm very well. Yeah, Neil sends his apologies. Hopefully the fact that he's not here doesn't switch people off. But I think we're going to have a quite a lively debate about some, a few different things and it uh, should be a good chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Q mass exodus of Golf YouTube channel with no Neil Tappen. It's just us two this week. Uh, but in absence of Neil, I have done a quiz question because I do enjoy this part of the podcast at the start. Um, my first foray into this uh, on, 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 on the uh, Gear of the Week show. And it's coming off the back. Neil asked us a few weeks ago, uh, who... Who first won with the Pro V1? I think it was the question, something like that. And it was Billy Andrade, was it? Something like that. So That's right, yeah. On. Back in 2000. Correct. Now, I asked him on the spot, like, how many wins does it have now? And I, oh. I obviously didn't have that information to hand. I, I also can't find that information. So the question I have come up with, and this was a nugget on the Golf Monthly website I found while doing some research earlier, was <laughs> in what year did the Titleist Pro V1 reach 3,000 tour wins? That's so, a good question. You know the so answer, do you? I've got, I've got the year it happened in. So a, a year, 3,000 wins occurred. I couldn't find the exact amount. So we know the ball was first won in the year 2000. 3,000 wins occurred. In what year did that happen? And for a bonus point, who who was the winner that sent it over that, that milestone? Obviously not going to know who did that. <laughs> but uh, if I had to guess the Give year. Me yeah, the year. Uh, I would say... Uh, 2018. Boom. Boom. Well done. That's Joel. not, surely not. Yeah, spot on. That's, you've just. I promise you, I've not cheated. I've not looked at anything. That was a complete guess. I, th we haven't spoken before this, by the way. No. We do, so that was generally, well, genuinely rather. I guess um, that's why I get paid the big bucks. That's right? why you get paid the big bucks. You know, niche information like that. So this was a piece on the Golf Monthly website. I typed in how many wins does it have, and I don't know how many it has to date, as of today. Uh, but on uh, November the 13th, uh, 2018, Lee Westwood won uh, and sent the pro Titus Pro V1 to over 3,000 tour wins. And there obviously, I'll have a lot more now. So, well done, Joel. Yeah. That's three for three now, or four for four, how many we've recorded. Well, but you're I got a clue on the last one, but yeah. Oh, no, yeah. I'm doing all right, I'm doing all right. Three and a half, so it well is done. My, it's my only area of expertise in life, so you'd like <laughs> to think I'd get most of them right. <laughs> Brilliant, well done. Uh, well, Neil will be back next week with a, with a quick question as well. We enjoyed that part. Okay, let's start off with some uh, new gear that's been announced in the last week or so. Um, this one got a lot of people talking on Twitter I saw the other day, Joel. It's the Callaway Great Big Bertha range. It's currently, I think it's only a US product but it's the price that got people talking, a price per iron specifically, I think. Mm. Yeah, so the, as you said, it's US only product at the moment. It's uh, the Callaway Great Big Bertha range and the irons cost $450 a club. That's, uh, so, uh, that, you know, that just, that just pains to say out loud, isn't it? I know, uh, where, how? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of how? money, but the, you know, these are, from what I've read, you know, technology packed clubs and the irons in particular, They've got 145 grams of tungsten in each head, which is so more than more than double the amount of tungsten I've ever seen put in an iron before. <laughs> yeah. They've so, loaded it with tungsten, but yeah. But, and sorry, go on. I was going to say, for people who don't know, tungsten is like a high density material, right? So it's got this cartridge of tungsten on the back, so it creates the the deepest CG of any iron Callaway have ever created. So it's going to be really powerful. It's going to be really high launching, and the whole idea behind the range is the fact that it's very lightweight, very user friendly and very easy to swing. So it's it's really aimed at, you know, moderately to slow swing golfers who want a bit more help, want a bit more speed. Um, the product looks fantastic. It looks super premium. It matches up with the price tag that is also super premium. Um, but I think, you know, while the, the market for it is relatively niche, I think if you do make the investment in it, you're probably going to really enjoy like what, how the clubs perform. Um, especially if you're in that that target demographic of a relatively slow swinger. Yeah, that is going to be exciting to see how many they even sell of them and, and who it's at is pretty clear. I just I just think all the time when I see stuff like this, and I don't deny it will be a great product that's innovative, etc. What was it, 450 a club? In the irons, yeah, driver's okay. $700. 
Yeah. Okay, let's let's just do the iron set, right? Let's just do five to wedge. That's six. Call it five hundred dollars, three grand. Mm. I'd rather go. Surely a golfer would get more from lessons there, perhaps with their, you know, a set of old cavity back irons. That's just me playing devil's advocate there because that's a lot of money. Yeah, I, you know, but there are golfers out there. You know, generally speaking, gol- golfers are relatively affluent, and yeah, you know, there are markets like Asia where p- people are willing to pay premium prices for golf clubs. That's just kind of what they're accustomed to doing. That is, this is aimed at you know country club members. They've got a yeah. lot of money. They're not affected by cost of living crisis or no. inflationary need, costs or anything like need that. Need a few extra know. yards and that. That yeah, uh, that's fair enough. You know, people who money isn't a problem and they want something that's aspirational and it looks really good in the bag. Um, I think yeah, that this is the type of person these are aimed at. It'll be exciting to see how they perform as well. Um, but yeah, definitely got a lot of people talking, didn't it? They do look good and. It's it's something that we're really interested to see. So hopefully we get to test one uh, when they're released soon. Um, I'm going to talk about a golf trolley now, something that's been released. I literally got it through the door today, still currently boxed up, but I do have a press release I can talk about and and doing some research on this. Uh, it's the Gulfstream Blue. Now, Gulfstream won't be a, a hugely well-known brand, I don't think, to anyone in the UK or the US, but they make some fantastic trolleys. Uh, or electric caddies, or uh, or carts, or carts. Well, well, I'm so bored of this debate. <laughs> it's you know what you know what I'm on about, right? People that know thing with about. wheels that you put thing your with bag wheels, on, yeah. clubs on, got a battery, goes forward when you press a button. Okay, cool. Everyone's on the same page now. Um, uh, but this one from Goldstream, the blue, uh, which has just been launched, is like a real back to basics model. And I've tested a lot over the last sort of year or so with, you know, GPS is in or remotes or follow technology in the case of the of the Stuart Q follow. That are all absolutely fantastic and they are laden with tech and really do enhance the playing experience. But what I think Goldstream are going for here, Joel, is you know, even no screen on it, just a dial, forward and back, start and stop, nice and simple, folds away really easy, super lightweight, probably about three or four kilos more lightweight than a you know a, a remote one or even more with GPS in. So lightweight, folds down small, clubs on, back and forth, no nonsense. Um, and I'm really excited to try this because it's great having a GPS in there. But some people might already have a GPS or have a laser range. I don't need this technology. So there needs to be a product uh, for people who just want a nice, basic, functioning trolley car. So this, this should be quite cool, I think. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like The number one function of any golf trolley or car is to transport your clubs around the course, right? And that, that's the main thing it needs to do. And as you say, if you've already got a distance measuring device, uh, you just want something basic that's going to do that job without costing too much money. I haven't seen the release, but I'm guessing it's quite an affordable option uh, 469 pounds yeah which so there you go. Is in that market is really quite impressive and i know yeah. it's going to be a a well-built premium feel so you're not going to lose the materials there it's just the tech you're losing out on or, or missing out on rather yeah and i think the the Gulfstream trolleys we've tested in the past have proven to be pretty robust and reliable so i think there's some pretty good value for money there for people who just want something really simple put the bag on press a button off you go it's going to be a really good option for them yeah, so it's really now under nine kilos, which is pretty important as well. Because I think for some people, like number one is, especially if you're a bit older or less mobile, getting something in and out of your car is lightweight. You know, I don't care what it comes with. I want it to be easy. I don't want to put my back out before I even swing a golf club. Um, so that will be that will be good to use. So I'm excited to try that after all the, the tech-laden ones I have used this year. Let us know how you get on, mate. I will. I absolutely will. And um, I'm sorry for people who have come specifically to hear about the golf boots i was due to test this week unfortunately i didn't i will feed back on those soon um but check out i'll have a full review of that trolley up in the next couple of weeks hopefully on the golf monthly website um next up oh this i'm looking forward to this you just previewed me this before we started recording joel uh the golf buddy atom range finder is tiny it, it, i want to see, show, show us show it us all it's it's cute it's, i would say it's cute yeah i mean it kind of the name where it says it all really this is the golf yeah. body and if i put it in my hand you can see how small it actually is i've got a tee here this is like a, okay. a normal driver tee yeah so you can see it's actually pretty much the same Jeez. length. it's actually slightly shorter than this this golf tee that i've got here so, that's a good comparison size actually we yeah. all know what a golf tee is so but it's, it's interesting I've been, i was testing it on the course last week and and while because it's really small you might think oh, that's going to be really difficult to hold and really difficult to use because I've, my hands are relatively big. But actually, it was su- surprisingly easy to hold and use. Like, you can still get to all the buttons perfectly well. It charges by micro USB, which is quite cool. I think all laser rangefinders should do that. Yeah. Um, and it's got lots of features on it, slope, a um, few different modes. It vibrates when the pin's picked out, et cetera. So there's a lot to like about it. Why they've decided to make one this size, like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. 
I didn't have a problem with traditionally sized lasers, but mm. um, if you want something that's a bit more compact, a bit sleeker on your bag, it does come with this really nice premium that's a nice. ivory coloured kind of leather case, which is very that's, nice. Because I've noticed a lot of laser rangefinder cases are very similar, sort of like a grey mm. or red, black or red, like a hardback uh, with the thing, they all look really similar. So that will make it stand out for sure. Yeah, it's quite an elegant, refined product. Um, I think very aspirational, uh, very cool. And as I said, the size doesn't seem to detract from the user experience. I've only tested it briefly, but uh, so far I've really enjoyed using it. So uh, yeah, yeah, look out for it. You're right, though, because like I've never had a problem. With, I've never heard people go, oh, my God, my range of range find is massive. Uh, which but, phone is that? Though? That's just an, uh, it's an iPhone SE. Okay. You can see that's quite a lot Still, smaller. It's tiny. That's yeah. really, really small. But you're right. No one's ever been moaning about, oh, gosh. My laser range finder is a bit bulky. Do you know what I mean? All, they've all, they all generally fit in the palm of your hand. So it is mm. interesting to see a brand go, right, let's make a little small one and see and see what people think of that. Um, I'll be interested to see your review on that as well. Coming soon. Coming soon. Keep your eye out on the Golf Hunter website, everybody. Um, okay, brilliant. That is a, a host of new gear out this week, then. We hope you uh, get yourself stuck into them. Uh, but we're going to hear now um, from Ryan Fox, the New Zealand golfer, one of the hottest golfers in the world right now, Joel. Is that a bit... That's not too bold to say. Oh, he's in the world at the minute. He's, he's, had, a, he's yeah, had a great he's year. Playing the best golf of his career. I think he started the year in the low 200s in the world wow. rankings. And he's now, uh, what did you say, 25th, 26th? 26th in the world. As, of, as of time of recording, yeah. Two wins, um, a lot of other top fives. Um, absolutely ripping it at the moment. And uh, we had an exclusive chat with him. Well, we didn't. Martin Hopley, our putting head putting expert did yes uh so martin hopley met him uh, a few weeks ago it's a really interesting wide-ranging interview talking about um you know gear mistakes he's made and, it, and if he's in, broken any clubs in anger um i was stay up for that bit uh but martin starts off by asking him uh, why he adopted uh, the arm lock putting uh, technique so uh, uh, enjoy the interview i know you sort of put with an arm lock method uh, why did you adopt that uh basically i was just i struggled big time with the putter um you know my my first few years on tour, it was always really streaky, um, and the bad was bad, and the good was good, but there sort of it got to a point where there wasn't a whole lot of good left, um, and I wanted something different, and grabbed, I literally grabbed someone's arm lock, and I think it was a Saudi international a few years ago, grabbed one, said, oh, that feels pretty good, used it the next, got one built up the next week for the Vic Open and finished second, and I've used one ever since, and in terms of, like, the technique side of things for me, it takes a lot of the face rotation out, which is what I really struggled with with the short putter. Um, I maybe struggle a little more with speed comparatively, but you know, it's certainly a lot nicer feeling more comfortable over the three footers than you know worrying, worrying about having to hit it to a foot from sort of 30 or 40 feet. Like I was pretty good at that with the short putter, but um, it's definitely take the uh, being a bit more confident over the shorter putts. Did you have to get the putter adjusted in particular because I know they've got a little bit more loft than regular putters, haven't they? Yeah, it um, took a little bit to get it right loft-wise. I think I run about six and a half now. Um, it's kind of, you don't want too much, obviously, lean forward, but, you know, you obviously need enough loft for there to be a little bit of lean so it runs up the forearm properly. And um, the thing I kind of struggled with a little bit with them is they, because they're long, they have to be quite heavy, and it took a little bit to get to get it to feel right off the face and, and get that speed control a little better. Um, and you know, I've, I've sort of gone through three or four different models of arm locks, but sort of found a couple that I I really like now. Is there any particular tips or techniques you've got for amateurs are trying to use that method? Um, you've got, well, the big thing is it's, it feels quite uncomfortable. You almost feel like you're a little bit shoulders open at a dress and that's not a bad thing. Um, and for me, like, I grew up playing cricket, so it almost felt like it, you know, it was more of a little cricket cover drive or, or straight drive rather than what you get used to with the short putter. So I think you know, you, it's much more shoulders and arms based rather than you know, there's not much in the hands. And you almost feel like you're kind of blocking it online, if that makes sense. It's, it's a little bit of a different feel, but you know, it, for me, it took a lot of the face rotation out. And I think that's, that's pretty important. And you know the biggest thing is just getting used to the speed you know getting used to using your arms and your shoulders and stuff to control speed rather than use your hands at you know especially the really longer parts you know 50 feet plus it takes a little bit of practice to get used to that and when it comes to amateurs and their equipment what are the sort of equipment mistakes that you might see amateurs make most uh probably the biggest one is actually not getting fitted um you know and I, I can see both sides of the coin there. You know, if I'm a 20 handicapper, what's the point of getting fitted? But 
you know, it does make a massive difference. Um, you know, making sure the lie angles are right. You know, if you you might be hitting something left because the lie angles are wrong, not because your swing's bad kind of thing. And, you know, especially distance wise, you can pick up a lot of yards with the right shaft. You can pick up, you know, get a bit more spin on the ball with your irons or whatever. And it certainly makes golf a lot easier. So I'd say that's, for me, that's the biggest equipment mistake. Probably the next one would be not having enough loft on your driver. You know, most amateurs sort of see, oh, I'm going to have nine, nine and a half. That's what the pros used and sort of doesn't fly very far. So having, actually having some loft on your driver is quite important. Should, um, do you think amateurs should uh, practice uh, with the same ball that they play with? And, and if so, what are the advantages of, of doing that? Um, yes and no. I mean, on the range, obviously, it's much more convenient to use whatever's there. And I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Um, but it's just you can't get any numbers, any distances off that. But certainly around the greens, um, on the putting green especially. But you know what, I always get frustrated at you know when I go out and see amateurs and they get a bucket of range balls and start using them on the chipping green. It, I mean, it gives you it gives you nothing. I honestly think you're better off grabbing three or four of your own balls and just going to chip around there, and then you, you actually feel like you learn something, learn how the ball reacts, learn how to hit sh certain shots because. The range ball just comes out completely different. So, you know, for standing there hitting balls on the range, working on technique, range balls are fine. But if you want to get some numbers, if, if you want to work out how far you hit your irons, and you want to do some short game, definitely use your own ball. Um, do you have any unusual gear requests yourself for the boys that strike some? Not really. I mean, my stuff's generally quite heavy, so I've got a fair bit of lead tape on it. Um, that would be about it. The only funky thing I've got on my bag, I've got a three model old two iron that I can't seem to get rid of. The new stuff is great, but I just seem to, the one I've got I really like, and that's the only real quirky thing I've got in my bag, to be honest. Is that because you sort of get used to trusting it? And... Yeah, the, the trust in it, um, I think the shaft that I've got in it works really well with that head, and I kind of need to change shaft if I want to use one of the new heads. So, it, you know, normally I'm pretty good at changing. That's the one thing that's kind of not changing in my bag. And finally, um, have you ever broken a club in anger? And if so, what happened? Um, I don't think I've broken a club in anger on the golf course. I've definitely broken a club in anger off the golf course. The one I remember is New Zealand Open a few years ago now. I three-putted the last to, to miss the cut. And uh, I'd eagled 17 to get on inside the cut number and then three-putted from about 20 feet on the last. And I was understandably quite headless. And I managed to, to keep it in until I signed my card and I walked out to the car park and wrapped my putt around a tree. So that's, that's the only one I've really broken in anger and you know, thankfully wasn't, wasn't in front of people. Um, I can certainly understand why people do it though. Golf's a very frustrating game at times. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Martin. And thank you, uh, Ryan Fox, featuring on the, on the Gear of the Week show. Uh, excellent interview. Uh, Joel, have you ever broken a golf club, smashed it around a tree? I, I really enjoyed your story there. He did it away. <laughs> he did it away. Like that takes a lot of composure to have that anger build and build, and then go to a car park and, and smash a putter. Definitely. I have never broken a club in anger. I'm really? So oh, you, I do like to throw them into the bag. I've broken a few arcos sensors by doing that into the bag, um, but never a club. Right. Yeah, I, I've snapped a wedge over my um, my leg once. Um, uh, I threw a putter at my bag when I was a junior and it just kind of shattered into a few different pieces. Uh, so yeah, I've had a few incidents with broken, not recently. I might, you know, my temper has mellowed a bit recently, Good. but uh, yeah, I do have some experience of breaking clubs. Uh, so yeah, I've never, I've never thrown one, one into a lake either. That that's, that's a more embarrassing one. I think I did, I, I was traveling with my clubs last week and I did the thing where you unscrew the heads and put them in the head cover and then put them in the bag. So as they don't oh, did you in travel, yeah, I saw it online. I thought that is, Fantastic. I did see someone put a bucket over the... Did you see someone put a Home Depot bucket over the top of the golf clubs to protect them? That was quite clever. It's but I like the unscrewing technique to obviously protect the heads. But what I then did when I was in the hotel reception ready to check out, unscrewing my heads is then to protect them is then the hybrid head dropped from a great height onto a nice marbly hard floor and just like the screws went... Pew, and I've not checked wow. whether it's fully broken yet. But it, it, in trying to save my golf clubs from air, uh, airport transfers, I have potentially broken it. So you've also got to remember exactly what setting you had each club on before when you put them back. I worry so. about that. I did. I did. I did. I noted it down because right. I'm a nerd like that. Isn't that Good. boring? Um, 
Uh, but yeah, no broken clubs. Uh, but he did, Joel, talk about the arm lock putting technique uh, at the start of the interview, which I found uh, really interesting. He's really honest. He just wasn't a very good putter. So I, I, I got this in my hand and tried it out. I've never tried it. I've like stood with one and I feel really awkward. You've given it a go. What sort of insight can you give people? Yeah, I actually, similar to Ryan, was struggling with my putting a few years ago and decided to put, put one in the bag for a little bit. It has a Betanardi one, so it's from a few years ago. And it, it, it does feel very strange at first. It's one of those things that you just have to practice with and, and persist with so that that feeling becomes a bit more natural, a bit more second nature. And it does, your stroke does become much more robotic, which I suppose is a good thing in that you're trying to be more consistent. So if you're feeling like it's more robotic, that's going to be a good thing. But, and, and for me, it definitely helped with short range parts because for two reasons, obviously, because the shaft is connected to your arm, it feels like the face is moving around less. And also because it's been more upright as well, I felt like the the, the putter face wasn't rotating as much. Mm. Um, but it, I did still struggle with long range putts. So there was a few embarrassing moments where, you know, I've, I've got a 30 foot putt and I'm hitting it 10 foot past or 10 <laughs> foot short because you, because you haven't got that feel in your hands yeah. of, of how far the, 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 the putter's moving or what speed it's moving at. So calibrating speed, is the the big problem i think with arm lock putting and it may be you know you should adopt something like bryson does by literally calibrating the length of backswing based on where the, your your feet are yeah to help you with that and then maybe that's something i should have tried but I essentially i struggled too much with pace that i reverted back to a normal putter but i can see the benefits of it especially from short range if you struggle with consistency and holding out from that key area I know a lot of golfers watching Will as well, so it could be quite an attractive prospect actually, because there's nothing more frustrating than miss like doing all the hard work and missing, you know, a bunch of four foot putts or whatever. But I think the key, and I, and I know Ryan mentioned it, saying generally people need to get fitted more. He doesn't see enough of it. The arm lock is something you should not just go and pick up or buy online. You should really go and get looked at for it and fitted to it properly, because you might not you might not be suitable for it in any case. You know what I mean? Yeah, and there's a lot of different nuances around the length of it, what feels comfortable for your arm, and obviously the loft as well, depending yeah. on what feels comfortable for you at a dress, you might present slightly a different amount of shaft lean to someone else, and that will affect the loft of putter that you need on that particular style. So, yeah, definitely go for a custom fitting and get fully dialed into it. We, and there's a few brands that offer it now as well. Ping do one, do they? Sick do one, Betanadi do one, Even Roll do one. Even Roll Midlock is a really good option as well, yeah. actually, um, which, we, which I've tried. So, yeah, there's a few good options out there. It's interesting more brands do it because I, I, we had a couple of golf monthly readers do a do a sick putter fitting over the summer and I, I got to to watch that uh, take place. Neither of them went for the arm lock in the end. Neither of the lads who who got fitted, but they both had a go with it, and you could sort of see straight away how uncomfortable they were initially. So I, I do think this is a niche, and don't expect to go into an arm lock fitting and go, yeah, this is class, this is great for me. It will feel weird, and you might just go, actually, no. Uh, so it was interesting to see two guys never tried it before go in it and just literally like. It's like they've never seen a putter before. And I was the same, to be fair. That's the problem with like, yeah, being fitted into something that requires time and patience to to get to get comfortable with. Um, so it's always going to be a challenge with arm lock. But I guess hopefully the feelings that you get when you first try, you think, oh, actually, that feels better. Yes. And therefore that would encourage you to stick with it for a bit longer. It, it's the one thing I think you get fitted for that really would, you know, if you got fitted for a new set of irons, there'd be a, you know, an adjustment period, but the longest adjustment period would be into an arm lock putter for sure. I think that would take a heck of a long time. But something to, something to think about, and listen, if it works for Ryan Fox, he's playing as well as he's at the minute, uh, it should work for us or amateur golfers in general, shouldn't it? Uh, brilliant. So thank you, Ryan, for featuring that. Uh, thank you uh, to Martin Hopper as well for, for the interview. Really enjoyed that. Okay, let's have uh, our weekly debate then, Joel, we, as we always have at the end of uh, the Gear of the Week show. Um, this week, inspired by a piece uh, you posted last week on the Golf Monthly website about why you're struggling or why you regret using a combo set, which I think is, I read it, it was really, genuinely really interesting, as, as all your stuff is, obviously. Um, but I think it's something I've not seen online a lot. People tend to rave about these sort of things. A lot of people go for this a combo set. Um, so do you want to talk about why you regret it? And actually, if you could just start by talking about what a combo set is for people who might not be aware. Yeah, so a combo set is where you mix the different type different types of heads within the set to get performance or types of performance where you want it within that area of the set so for example uh, you might transition from cavity back mid irons into something that's a bit larger and more forgiving in the long irons to give you more consistency and forgiveness where you need it or where on those longer iron shots where the shaft's a bit longer and you're further away and they're harder to strike more cleanly so um, but for me personally, so I tr I had a combo set where I went from hollow-headed 
um, long and mid irons into kind of one piece muscle cavity short irons. And that was for me, I thought it was the right decision at the time, but having used them for a year, year and a half, um, can clearly see that it's not working for me and I've got the data to prove it. So I think I'm not, I'm not slagging off combo sets completely. I'm not saying people shouldn't do it. I think the way I've done it probably isn't the way to go. You probably go the other way and opt for um, splitting the set in those longer irons to get more help. This is a really interesting debate and and maybe we'll flash up your Arcos data actually for people to look at now because I think it kind of hammers home the point. So you want to talk through this because where, which irons do you have the, the MCs in again? Is it eight, nine wedge? That's right. Yeah. So P770s uh, in the, in four to seven iron yeah. and then eight, nine. And you can just see, I'm looking at that. You can just see that drop off from 164 to, to 145 between seven and eight iron. Yeah, it's, 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 that's a, it's that's unforgivable a really to have a, a gap of nearly 20 yards between between irons. Uh, and then you probably going to mention it, but the stats as well from a seven iron to eight iron, I'm missing the green more short with an eight iron than I am a seven iron. I'm hitting more greens with my seven iron than, than I am my eight iron. Should be and that obviously it shouldn't it should be the other way around. Yeah. So, um, well, well, we'll flash that data up now. So it's showing 23 percent short with your eight iron, which is a heck of a lot. So. Yeah, I'm sure you're chipping around eight prints of the front of greens has gone, you know, through the roof now. But yeah, you'd rather be putting from that. Um, yeah. So you're saying you would go because I've got, and you mentioned at the end of this piece, um, something like the, the Ping I-59, and I have them. And I'll be honest, I really struggled with them for the first few months because it was quite a jump from my old clubs to be to to strike them so well. But I've always, and I really struggled with my five and six iron in this set. And I've always thought, should I be going into something like the you could probably go in the I-230 or something up there, um, mm. or even the I-525. I, I don't know what it would be. Is that how you would do it then? Because I think the combo sets that appeals to a lot of people because five or six times are hard to hit anyway. So what would you have gone for, basically? Yeah, so I think what I probably would and would do now is just go for a full set of P770s because yeah. actually my long iron play with those clubs, because they're hollow and they're quite springy, um, I think I'll be fine to do that. The reason I did what I did was because I didn't. I felt like if I had hollow, a hollow pitching wedge and a, and a hollow nine nine eight time, they might go a bit too far, and I yeah. wouldn't get the control and consistency from those short iron shots. Let's let's face it; these are the sort of distances where you want to be attacking the pins. Mm. But actually, on reflection, my ball striking isn't as good as it probably warrants using a club like the P seven MCs, which don't get me wrong, are really nice clubs and if yeah. you're a good ball striker you're going to really enjoy the feel and the consistency and that kind of strong flight they offer. But I just, I was, I found myself swinging harder to try and get them to hit the ball the distance I wanted them to. And because I was doing that, I was, I was more inconsistent with the strike because I was swinging it faster. So it was like a vicious circle. Um, so yeah, it was just a, you know, a real eye opener for me to looking at the distance because it, it was a feeling that I had. I knew that I, I was losing something while I am play. Yeah. And I was looking at the Arcos data, seeing that shift in the distances from that eight iron to seven iron. I think the combo set was the reason for it. So, because I, I always found when I used to fit people and people were coming from that handicap range of, let's say, I played off 18 to 20 for a year or so and we're now down 15 or 12, something like that. That's a, that's a bit of a purgatory area, I think, for equipment we're not purgatory but there are so many options you can go back to cavities and stick with them you can go for players distance maybe on a future proof them when i'm a single finger handicapper so that's why combo sets are so popular so someone who might be watching now who loves the look of these clubs as well by the way that is a big sort of why i want these someone might be looking at getting a combo set now not brand specific but would you say either go for a full set of a player's distance iron or something like the p770 or would you say maybe go five and six or four, five and six in something else. I don't know. What would you say to them? So so my first thing would be the, the justification of a combo set is player dependent. It didn't get on well for me, but it might work for you depending on how you strike the ball and things like that. I, I personally think that, as I said before, transitioning from something into the long irons would be more beneficial. Um, but the one thing I would say is, is make sure the lofts relatively match up with the different models. So you don't want to pick you know, a P770 5 iron, then go maybe into a P790 4 iron, which is three degrees stronger than a P774 iron. And then you've got a big distance gap there that's going to mess around with your the clubs in the area of the bag and the distance is going to get just to have as big a gaps as you would then when as you did with, with me and the um, the 7 and 8 iron. So make sure that the loft things match up, relatively speaking, um, across the models. 
Um, you can adjust them to a degree. Ping, do, power, and retro spec. So yeah, I do. I like I like that option a lot. That gives people a little bit more wiggle room with yeah. with certain sets. You could opt for a game improvement ping iron retro spec, which would match up then with with an i series iron. But for you, I think definitely going from i fifty nine to i two thirty in those slightly longer irons would be a good option. Yeah, I'm, I've sort of I've had these for about a year now, and I get I get on really well seven iron down with the i fifty nines. That they've been brilliant clubs to me. They brought my handicap down four or five shots already. Probably should be more in. Joel would suggest more the way I've played recently. Um, but yeah, I'm really like, again, I think we spoke about this in our hybrids debate in, in the first episode of Gear of the Week where my four, five, and six iron all do the same thing. And that's because I can't quite strike them as well. So maybe instead of bringing hybrids in, I bring in a different kind of iron. Um, but it's a really interesting topic, John. It was a really, you know, go check out this piece on the Golf Weather website, a little bit more detail in there. And you can, we'll, we'll put a link to it in the description. Below yes, we shall. We shall. And you can sort of delve into those stats a little bit more because that drop off is pretty brutal. So, what are you what are you going for now? Because you're, you're a lucky man, you get lots of irons sent your way. Um, what, what, what do you think you're going to do? Because I mean, you probably stick with these for a bit or wait for something new to come out that you're testing or what, what are you doing? Tease us with your, your future what's in the bag. <laughs> Can't say too much, but oh, of course, yeah, <laughs> maybe. I mean, if you look at the cadence of uh, the lifestyle, the product like lifestyle of TaylorMade's P series, you would expect they might, they might have one. some new ones coming out soon. Ooh. And therefore, if they did have some new P770s coming out, if then I would choose a full set of those. For sure, but but there's a lot of good options, you know, across different brands. You know, Ping I two thirties are excellent, and they're very comparable with P seven seventies. You know, you've got Mizuno um, JPX uh, nine two three hot hot metals are really nice. Uh, hot metal Pro, sorry. Um, a lot of brands have a lot of different good clubs in that space. You know, aimed yeah. at low handicappers, but are yeah. also quite forgiving as well. So uh, we shall see on that. Yeah, watch this space. There is, you know, it's that time of year, isn't it, Joel? Lots of stuff coming out. So very excited, potentially coming out. Who knows? Uh, very exciting. Um, but that will about wrap it up uh, for this episode of uh, the Gear of the Week show. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. As I always say, get down in those comments if there's any uh, debates you want to hear us talk about, equipment questions, uh, equipment reviews you want us to go more in depth on that you might see on the website. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and, and have this show driven by by your suggestions as well as our own. Uh, but for now, that's uh, that's it from me and from Joel. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back next week. Thank you very much for watching.